as usual, I am announcing that the list of speakers will close in 15 minutes. Okay, uh, let's take you live now to Geneva, uh, where the UN Special Rapporteur Francesca Albanese is speaking about Israel's war on Gaza, the Human Rights Council. Let's have a listen in. It is with the heaviest heart that I appear before you today to deliver my fourth report as the Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territory. Following nearly six months of unrelenting Israeli assault on occupied Gaza, it is my solemn duty to report on the worst of what humanity is capable of and to present my finding, the anatomy of a genocide. History teaches us that genocide is a process, not a single act. It starts with the dehumanization of a group as other and the denial of that group's humanity and ends with the destruction of the group in whole or in part. The dehumanization of Palestinians as, the group, as a group is the hallmark of their history of ethnic cleansing, dispossession and apartheid. In the words of Edward Said, Palestinians were made orphans of a homeland by the creation of the State of Israel and its continuous policies intended to erase their presence from their land. Genocide is defined in international law as specific sets of acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. It is often referred to as the crime of crimes due to its complexity and because of the challenge of proving the specific intent as the Convention requires. And yet, this complexity is not about the creation of a hierarchy among atrocity crimes. It's rather a reflection of a different nature and scale. The heightened threshold for intent, namely to destroy a group as prescribed by Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, must be proven directly or inferred from facts which admit of no other reasonable inference. But when genocidal intent is so conspicuous, so ostentatious as it is in Gaza, we cannot avert our eyes. We must confront genocide. We must prevent it and we must punish it. The catastrophic situation I investigated is known as it has been broadcast to the world in real time by its victims. Astoundingly, rather than halting its momentum, a minority of powerful member states have provided military, economic and political support for the atrocity, compounding the devastation it has wrought for the Palestinians. In this assault, the sixth and most egregious in 16 years, Israel has killed more than 30,000 Palestinians, including 13,000 children, more than the children killed in all conflicts worldwide in four previous years. Journalists, doctors, nurses, artists, academics, engineers, scientists, and their family members, a whole society has been targeted. A further 12,000 Palestinians are reported missing, most presumed dead. Some, some 71,000 Palestinians are reported missing. Most, uh, sorry. Most with, sorry. Some 71,000 are injured, most with life-changing wounds, made worse by the decimation of the healthcare system and overwhelming unsanitary conditions created in Gaza. In the first two weeks, Israel prevented all humanitarian aid from entering Gaza, and in the ensuing months, it has imposed extreme restrictions of water, food, electricity and fuel. Israel has blocked the entry of medical supplies, including anesthetics, incubators and even baby formula. Convoys have hardly reached northern Gaza. The deliberate policy has induced rapid and sustained severe food insecurity in the entire population, with those trapped in the north forced to eat animal, animal feed and grass. The occupying power has also undermined UNRWA, the main lifeline to Palestinians in Gaza. Growing numbers of Palestinians are dying of starvation as we speak, and the hostages and their families have also not escaped these devastating circumstances. 
the collective scars of those who survive are certain to last generations. In the initial weeks of the assault, Israeli forces killed around 250 Palestinians daily through an apocalyptic arsenal of weaponry on one of the most densely populated places on Earth. 25,000 tons of explosives, equivalent to two nuclear bombs, unguided munitions and hundreds of 2,000 pound bunker buster were used to level entire neighborhoods. The ground offensive changed the pattern, but not the scale of destruction. In less than six months, Israel has destroyed Gaza, erasing or severely damaging almost all civilian infrastructure and agricultural land, most of homes, health care facilities, telecommunication infrastructure, every university, most educational facilities, municipal services, mosques and churches, and innumerable cultural heritage sites, which are integral to the social fabric of Palestine. Israeli soldiers have published footage boasting about their killing of families, mothers, children, the bombing of homes, mosques and schools. Self-incriminating videos show them sadistically mocking and humiliating their Palestinian victims, not only by violating their physical integrity and right to life, but also their dignity, their most intimate possessions and spaces that the soldiers have entered and looted and by desecrating cemeteries and places of worship. When the ground offensive started, the number of daily casualties seemed to reduce, but in fact, the level of atrocities increased. Mass disappearance and arbitrary detentions, widespread and systematic torture and inhumane treatment add to the experience of endless death and loss. Desperate people had to search through rubble with their bare hands. Many have been unable to bury and grieve loved ones. These acts of genocide have been motivated by vehement anti-Palestinian discourse, which characterizes the entire Palestinian people in Gaza as enemies to be eradicated or forcibly removed. This rhetoric has been pervasive across all segments of Israeli society. That Israeli high-ranking officials with command authority routinely called on soldiers to annihilate the people of Gaza is compelling evidence of explicit and public incitement to commit genocide. Evidence further indicates that this genocidal incitement has been internalized and acted upon by soldiers on the ground. One of my key findings is that Israel's executive and military leadership and soldiers have intentionally distorted rules of international humanitarian law, distinction, proportionality and precaution in an attempt to legitimize genocidal violence against the Palestinian people by deliberately stretching the definitions of human shield, evacuation orders, warnings, safe zones, collateral damage and medical protection, Israel has used their protective function as humanitarian camouflage with the effect of concealing patterns of conduct from which the only inference can reasonably be drawn is a state policy of genocidal violence against the Palestinians. Blurring the distinction between protected civilians or civilian infrastructure and combatants or legitimate military targets, Israel has effectively characterized the whole civilian population in Gaza as human shields or terrorist accomplices as a matter of legal policy. Those who manage to evacuate to areas that Israel defined as safe humanitarian zones have been met with further attacks, their deaths and injuries justified as collateral damage. By making repeated claims which have been systematically discredited that Hamas used hospitals as operation centers, Israel appears to be operating on the, premises, on the premise that if you tell a lie long enough, people will believe it. Israel has used the camouflage of humanitarian law to characterize the entire Palestinian people and life-sustaining and life-saving infrastructure of Gaza as targetable, killable, destroyable. Israel has attempted to legitimize, for example, the, def the devastations of Gaza's medical infrastructure, which has led to potentially thousands of additional deaths, life-changing injuries and trauma. IHL has, done, has thus been distorted to justify a war of annihilation. In light of this, I find that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the threshold indicating the commission of the crime of genocide against Palestinians as a group in Gaza has been met. Specifically, Israel has committed three acts of genocide with the requisite intent. 
causing seriously, serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. The genocide in Gaza is the most extreme stage of a long-standing settler colonial process of erasure of the native Palestinians. For over 76 years, this process has oppressed the Palestinians as a people in every way imaginable, crushing their inalienable right to self-determination demographically, economically, territorially, culturally and politically. Israel has attempted to displace them, expropriate their land and other resources and ultimately replace them. The colonial amnesia of the West has condoned Israel's colonial settler project from the violent history of the very birth of the State of Israel to its oppressive occupation since 1967, the crippling closure of Gaza since 1993 and its military assaults on Gaza since 2007. The world now sees the bitter fruit of the impunity afforded to Israel. This was a tragedy foretold. While the International Criminal Court will have to deliberate, the International, Crim Sorry. While the International Court of Justice will have to deliberate, the International Criminal Court will have to investigate. It is my responsibility to remind you that the Genocide Convention includes a use Kogan's norm and their government's obligation to prevent the commission of genocide. A reality the International Court of Justice recognized as plausible exactly two months ago. The time for states to act was then, and as they did not, the time is now. In this darkest hour, the international community cannot continue to ignore that it's Israel's project to rid Palestine of Palestinians in defiance of international law and the world's failure to call Israel to account that has led to genocide laid bare in Gaza. Denial of the reality and the continuation of Israel's impunity and exceptionalism is no longer viable, especially in light of yesterday's binding Security Council resolution I implore member states to abide by their obligations, which start with imposing an arms embargo and sanctions on Israel, and so ensure that the future does not continue to repeat itself. Thank you. I thank you. Okay, if you were, if you were just joining us, we were just listening to the uh, UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Francesca Albanese, uh, presenting her report to the Human Rights Council uh, saying that there are reasonable grounds uh, that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. We're joined now by our diplomatic editor, James Bayes. James, uh, an impassioned and powerful testimony by Francesca Albanese. Albanese. Talk us through some of the key highlights that she, she went through. Anatomy of a genocide is the report that she was just presenting. These reports don't normally have titles. She gave it a title and that is the case that she made. She's a human rights lawyer um, who before she got this job as an independent advisor to the Human Rights Council um, also served 10 years in the UN. So she knows the UN system and how it works. She knows this file extremely well uh, and she went through why she says this is is a genocide uh, through the various things that constitute a genocide to prove that they were that they had taken place including the fact of course that they were killing Palestinians which are the group uh, that she's claiming have been targeted for uh, genocide saying yes we know well over 30,000 Palestinians dead but she said another 12,000 almost certainly dead under the rubble and the amount of explosives used by the Israeli military about 25,000 tons she estimated that's the equivalent she said of two nuclear bombs and she said it's not just the genocide as we know from the discussions in the international court of justice in january which has also been discussing a genocide case you need to prove intent of genocide she said that there had been um, uh, quotes from all sorts of israeli officials all the way up the command structure right the way to the defense minister and prime minister uh, netanyahu that prove genocide she said uh, the genocide in intent was actually so ostentatious in this um, in this case that Israel wasn't covering up what it was doing she said they were also perverting the international um, humanitarian law um, using it to justify what she said was their war of annihilation and she said that Israel was working on the premise that if you tell a lie enough times people will start believing it 
James, tell us why reports like this, testimony like this matters. Uh, because people watching this may wonder, especially after the UNSC vote yesterday, which has been rejected by Israel, uh, this uh, testimony by Francesca Albanese has also been rejected by Israel. Why does it matter in, in, in terms of the bigger picture when yeah, nothing seems to be appearing, appears to be changing on the ground? Yeah, Israel has already said her report is an obscene inversion of reality. Uh, and Israel, it's worth noting, has not let the special rapporteur or any of her three predecessors who did the job in to even examine the situation. She has to all examine it from evidence from um, afar. So uh, there is a problem, problem with, with her post and what she can achieve. But add to what you have seen this year so far, the International Court of Justice, its provisional measures, th that ruling, the UN Security Council, it took almost six months, but it has voted for a ceasefire. Israel will ignore that as well. The fact that in that Security Council meeting 24 hours ago, there was applause at the end. There's never normally applause at the end of a Security Council meeting when a vote is cast. There was applause at the end of this meeting, very unusual. And those people applauding, they're not members of the public, they're ambassadors who are applauding, uh, showing what they're feeling. And I think in the Security Council in the last 24 hours, you saw Israel. Yes, the US didn't vote for the resolution, it abstained, but Israel was alone. And I think what is slowly developing is global isolation and condemnation for Israel. It's developing into a situation where it could become a pariah state, Go back maybe to apartheid in South Africa. Then uh, that country for 20 years was eventually suspended from the United Nations. For 20 years, it wasn't even allowed to take part uh, in, in UN activities. And I think it's that sort of um, isolation uh, and, and, uh, and global disdain that Israel might be facing. And it's exactly that this weekend that the US Secretary of State warned Prime Minister Netanyahu of when he talked about the possible Rafa offensive. He said Israel is facing global con condemnation and a real tarnishing of its, of its reputation long term. OK, thank you for that. Our diplomatic editor, James Bayes.